So the whole point of meta-analysis then, or one of the points is to work out how big an effect is, the effect size of your study or population or sample or intervention. And you may not be surprised to know that most people don't really know what, what an effect size is, and that's fine. And that's why we're here. So again, if you did a little quiz asking people what's an effect size, they'll, they'll look quite embarrassed and look to the floor and go, oops, don't really know. But it's, it's literally the entire point of doing science. So let's have a look. There's a lot of equations in this, but this, is, this section, section three, is really just a, a dump for all the equations that you might need. And I'll take you through gently. And then really, it's just this is just a repository for you to refer back to in the future for the kind of things you need to know. And it's more about knowing where to look. I think just like anything with research, it's, it's not about knowing the equations. I don't know the equations. It's about knowing where to look for them and how to find them and how to how to get the right one. So it's more about understanding the point of them rather than being able to reproduce them off by heart, which almost no one can do. So we're going to start with just a bit of a refresh of what you should know in order to do a meta-analysis and then different kinds of effect size and then an exciting practical in Excel. And if you don't like numbers and letters, then uh, turn off now. So the sum, so this, this sigma, this sigma thing is used to identify the sum. So when you have a sigma like this, this sort of E letter, and you have an X with a little I next to it, this bit of notation is telling you to add up all the, the numbers of X from, from the first one to the last one. And X is just your data. So if you've got 20 data points, 20 patients, 20 controls, whatever, you've got one to 20. So you're just adding them all up. And the reason we need to have symbols for them is because the equations get long, too long to put in words. But you'll see sigma like that, and it just means add up all the numbers that are in the brackets from one to the end. That's the sum. The mean is the same at the top there, but you just divide it by the number of, of numbers. So here's a fun fact in stats. If the stat is a, if the, the letter is like a Greek letter, it usually means the population or the, the unknown, the thing that you don't know, the thing that you're assuming exists out there somewhere in the world. If you use a Greek, it's for the unknown. And if you use the Roman letters, it's for things you do know. So a little mu, a little Greek mu is the unknown population mean, and a little Roman X with a with a hat on it is the known mean of the sample. There you go. Greek is unknown and Roman is known. Uh, so that's the formula for the mean. Looks too complicated. You add up all the numbers and divide by the number of numbers. Pretty straightforward. And this is going to be our main measure of central tendency or the middle of a distribution. So if you plot everyone's height, the mean is the middle height, the middle of the distribution, approximately. So the mean, right, it's used everywhere. You're going to need that. Um, the second most important thing is going to be the standard deviation. So it's a way of describing how the data are spread, how variable the data are from the mean. So the way you do it, you look at deviations from the mean. So you take each of your numbers, each of your x values, and compare it with the mean value. And that's the deviation. Nice and simple. So on average, half of these deviations are negative and half of them are positive. Half of them are less than the mean and half of them are bigger than the mean on average. What we want to do with statistics is look at all these deviations. If you just added up all the deviations, they're going to be zero. So that's not very useful. Half of the differences below zero and half the differences above zero, the average is going to be zero. To get a measure of the deviation, the average deviation, if you like, from the mean, you just square everything. So you take your deviations and you square them. So that's squared deviations, nice and simple. So it's like if your mean is 10 and the particular value you're looking at is 5, the difference is minus 5 and the squared difference is 25. So now we have a bunch of squared differences between each of your samples and the mean. And if you add all those up, you add up all the squared differences, you get the sum of squares. And that appears in all sorts of statistics. And then if you take that sum of deviations and divide by the number of numbers, n, you now have the variance, which hopefully you know is an extremely well used statistical phenomenon. It's the average or expected value of all the squared deviations from the mean. So if you've got your mean of 10 and your, let's say the average difference between the mean and each of your samples is five, then you add up all the squared deviations and divide by the number of numbers and you'll, you'll end up with a number around five squared, 25. Uh, the Greek letter for this is a lowercase sigma squared. The Roman one is S. So we usually use S, S for standard deviation and S squared for variance. 
and it's various ways of seeing it, but most of the time you'll you'll see it as S squared, the variance used in pretty much every single statistical calculation. So you'll need to know roughly what it is. Because this number is, let's say this number is, is 25, it's like the average squared deviation from the mean. It no longer really relates to the original data that you collected. So if you just take the square root of all that, yeah, if you take the square root of all that, you'll end up with a number that's closer to the original numbers, so the standard deviation. When you're talking about population, so if you have, here's the sigma value. So if you're talking about the Greek, the Greek population number, so that's basically saying, I know what the population is. I have all the data in the universe. Now that's never true, but let's say you're assuming that it is true. Then you can calculate the, the variance by dividing by N, just the total number of numbers that you've got. Uh, and some people use that and some people don't. Yeah, it has different uses. But in almost all statistics that you'll be using, i.e. when you're taking samples from a known population, uh, you don't divide by N, you divide by N minus one. That does something like it, it basically corrects for some biases and it i don't know i can't explain it to you it, there's a mathematical proof for it basically when you see n minus one it means you're correcting for the fact that you only have a sample from the population and you don't know exactly the population mean or standard deviation and pretty much you always divide n minus one for uh, the sample variance and the sample standard deviation so if you're seeing things, you'll see population being used and you'll, you'll see sample being used. Almost always, you'll need the sample version. And that's quite important. So if you're using Excel or spreadsheets or any anything else, they'll often give you a choice. Do you want the sample or the population standard deviation? And the correct answer is almost always the sample standard deviation or sample variance. So that, that's the N minus one. It just makes it slightly larger. So it gives you slightly more wiggle room, a slightly larger variance. So you have, yeah, slightly less chance of being wrong, I suppose. And the standard deviation, which it's the, um, the square root of the sum of the mean squared deviation from the mean divided by n minus one. You'll probably never need to reproduce it, but if you once you see it, and once you understand all the bits, so there are some deviations squared, there's the sum of squared deviations, dividing by n minus one and taking the square root. So that gives you the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is the most common measure of um, dispersion, how a, how a distribution of numbers is spread. So um, if you have a small standard deviation, everyone is about, has about the same number. If you have a large standard deviation, there's a big range of numbers across your sample. This looks even worse. So but it was, it's back to that number that I said was really important in all statistics. The standard error is very commonly used in error bars on graphs. It's used to calculate the t-statistic. It's used to calculate regression parameters. It's used in basically every every parametric statistic uses standard error in some in some manner. The uh, equation is getting quite top heavy, but essentially it's just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. So extremely useful, and you'll need this a lot. If you're doing any meta-analysis, you you may be able to put your put your data directly into some calculator and it will do it for you. But if you don't check this, then you'll make mistakes. And that's a bit of a clue to the, what was wrong with that example that I gave you in the first introduction. If you know nothing else about um, statistics, knowing this formula over here, that standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, that's going to get you a long way in working out how to extract effect sizes from papers. Now, the, uh, so the standard deviation is a measure of dispersion in general. So how, how widely spread is your distribution? And the standard error is a measure of the precision of a mean. So if you have a small standard error, you can be quite certain that the, the value you have for your mean is sort of quite precise. If you have a very large standard error, then you haven't got very precise data. So to get a small standard error, you can either get a smaller variance, get a smaller standard deviation, or you can get more data. So these, these three numbers here kind of tell you all you need to know about everything in statistics, power analysis, uh, meta-analysis, variability, how much data do you need to collect? How many, some, how many subjects do you need in your analysis? It, it's all about how big is your variability and how much data do you have? And that gives you the, the power or the strength or the precision of your, your measurements. So that, ignore the bit on the right, you don't need to know that, but the bit on the left, I think you really do need to know. So if you, if you have to write down anything, that little bit on the left, standard, standard error is the standard deviation divided by square root of n. Uh, all of that so far, 
all we're doing is describing the data. We're saying what's the mean, what's the variability, and what's the precision of the mean? How you know how variable is this given the number of data points we have? And those are all descriptive statistics. But you always want to make inferences, or almost always, you want to make some sort of probabilistic claim about data. And we often use 95%, sort of we want to have a 95% probability that a particular value is within the range of the values that you might expect. Yeah, if you're using 95% confidence intervals, and this, this is another thing to put on your error, on a error bar on a graph, you take your mean and you take approximately two standard errors above and below. So a 95% confidence interval is about four standard errors wide. If you have a million data points, if you have a million subjects or you're testing the whole population, if you have all the data in the world, 1.96 standard errors up and down is, is 95% of the um, distribution. It's not the distribution of all the values in your population. It's talking about the distribution of the likely mean only. So it's a standard error of the mean and it's a confidence interval of the mean. So it's not of the population, it's just of the mean. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so yeah, if you have a lot of data or you're studying the population, you can just use 1.96 to get 95%. Almost always, you're actually using a smaller sample, 10, 20, 30 data points. So instead of 1.96, you need to use the critical T value. And it's usually going to be about 2.2, 2.3, 2.1. And as you get more and more large samples, you get closer to 1.96. So in general, if you want a very approximate rule of thumb, the 95% confidence interval is two standard errors above and below your mean. And that's quite handy because if you have two different graphs, two different bar plots or something, and, and the confidence intervals are not overlapping at all, you know that they're at least two standard errors away from each other. So that's quite useful. And that's usually a significant difference. Uh, this is the formula in Excel. We'll get to that in a bit. T in, so the inverse of the T distribution. You end up with a number which is about 2, 2.2, 2, something like that. Uh, yes, everyone uses 95%. 95% confidence intervals, but other percentages are available. You can use 90, you can use 99. It just depends. Most people use 95 because most people use 95. But there's no reason not to calculate any other percentage you like. You don't need to know this. I just thought it's interesting uh, when I remember, and I remember being taught it in, in maths in um, high school. So all of the, the ways you might describe a graph or a distribution uh, are all related to each other. And they're all from all these formulas. The sum, the mean, the variance, the skew, and the kurtosis are all five moments, they're called. And I just, I find it nice to put it in a graph, uh, put it in a in one place, just so you all know that all these things are related to each other. And they're basically, they're basically the same thing, just repeated. The sum is just add all the numbers up. Mean, you divide by n. Variance, you square them and then divide by n. Skew, you cube them and then divide by n. And kurtosis, you, I think, to the power four, something or other. They're all related and they're all the same the same kind of principle about how you describe the shape of a graph. And there's a nice Wikipedia page on that, as you might expect. If all of that was a bit too much, here's a nice video. You can go and um, boost my YouTube credentials. So I, I made this for third year undergrads, I think. If you don't know Excel or Calc, or if you don't know how to enter formulas into um, into those places, or if just if you just want a refresher of any, any of that stuff, I think I do it all in there. Um, it's really just how you use Excel and how you put formulas into Excel. And hopefully you can do that or you can learn it extremely quickly. I've heard quite a lot. I heard it about a couple of days ago. It was someone criticized someone. Oh, you know, they're still doing they're st still doing their statistics in Excel. And I think they meant they're using Excel and they're not doing it in R or MATLAB or something. I don't, I don't care. I don't care where you do your statistics. I really don't. Paper and pencil is absolutely fine. Uh, Microsoft Excel is great. You can do lots of stuff in there. You can do meta-analysis in Microsoft Excel if you want. This this is the key thing. Um, I don't care where you do it. I don't use R myself. Uh, I've just refused because <laughs> it's just I've got enough programming languages that I use. So the key thing is is to understand it. And I I really think spending a couple of hours understanding the t-test is a better use of your time than trying to understand how to download R and you know, use the latest, exciting, extremely complicated statistical methods. Given how few people really understand stats, in my view, spend more time on the basics, I would urge you to do. Yeah, I'm going to take a break. That's my political message over. So now the uh, all important thing, what is an effect? Effect sizes, there's loads and loads of different kinds. And 
if you ask people they won't know typically you ask a scientist what's the effect size in your study they won't know and that's quite shocking um but basically it's what we're trying to do in science it's what we are trying to measure so if you have say an intervention diet drugs exercise whatever it is the thing you are trying to have an effect on is someone's heart rate or health or disease status or intelligence and the effect size you are trying the effect you are trying to have is what you're trying to measure so it could be you want people's height to go up by 10 centimeters if you give them lots and lots of calcium in their childhood for example so the effect size in some sort of dietary intervention study could be height you know a, a difference of 10 centimeters or a difference of x centimeters it could be different in blood glucose levels or it could be the hairiness of a rat's paw or whatever it is that you're measuring that's your effect size it could be the strength of relationship how strong is the relationship between smoking and lung cancer it could be a change in something over time so how how much you improve after an, in, an intervention uh, and so when you ask a scientist what's the effect size in your study or what's the effect in your study um, it, they usually interpret the question is statistical like oh you want some really complicated statistics that I don't really understand so I'm not going to tell you or I don't know but really it's like what are you actually trying to do with your study um, and it could be absolutely anything so the effect size in your study could be anything so because I can't I can't obviously cover everything in and in statistics you can't you can't change the statistics just to suit your suit your own variable all the time so you need some standardized standardized ways of re referring to these things and in statistics so you call your effect x so x could be the the change in height between two groups or that the height of two sets of people and because we're doing normal parametric stats today we're just going to assume that this thing that you're measuring is a continuous distribution of height for example it's random so if you pick someone at random on the street they'll have essentially a random height but you can say that the, the average height will be normally distributed and about 1.7 meters say for a human so the effective thing you're trying to measure or the thing you're intervening on and it could be something simple like an absolute effect size so these are when you're keeping the raw original units of your data so height is one example the size of anything so i'm using this system si units this is seconds meters kilograms amperes kelvin temperature moles of a drug or molecule and candelas of light so the absolute raw amplitude of something could be your effect size let's say you want to improve someone's marathon running time by 20 seconds and you could run some intervention then your effect size could be measured in seconds and these are extremely useful because they are in their original data you're not doing any transformation you're not you know confusing or obscuring them you've got your raw meaningful unit uh, slightly slightly away from that you could have a standardized test for example an, I, an iq test for example you could get a a standardized test um, number which might might be meaningful it might not be um, your grades on a course they're quite meaningful they're in a range restricted range of zero to 100 but essentially they're normally distributed and sort of random the point about absolute effect size is that they're they're meaningful on their own you don't need to do any more thinking if someone's quicker by 10 seconds that's it they're quicker by 10 seconds there's nothing more to add Occasionally, you need you may need to transform them. Like if they're slightly skewed data, or if they're not quite normally distributed, you might transform them to make them more normally distributed. But the numbers should still make direct sense. And the key thing is that when you take these numbers, so you take seconds out of ten different studies. Say your say your meta analysis was on what's the best way to improve marathon running times, and every single study measured the time in seconds or hours or whatever. As long as you can directly compare study A and study B in terms of the number of seconds that they improved, then you can do your meta-analysis in, in the raw units. And that's really the most useful kind. So wherever possible, you should try and meta-analyze data where you can keep the original units. And then you can make nice claims for the media saying, we gave people lots of spinach and children increased height by 10 centimeters. And that will be a very nice way to uh, give the results of your study. And the kind, the kind of stuff that gets into the media will be stuff like this that people can relate to immediately. But rarely that's what we deal with in science, sadly. So often we have to make, we have to sort of transform the data a little bit because the baselines are different. So if, if you think about a relative effect size, 
um, you've done some sort of pre-processing and usually it's to exclude changes relative to a baseline like lots of biological variables so it could be it could be a ratio it could be a percentage change odds ratios for disease risk is very common it may require transformation again to keep the data slightly normally distributed and this is the kind of stuff you'll see a lot in the media and it's the kind of stuff that people get really confused about so normal people who don't have a stats training will get very confused even a simple ratio so things like we increase children's heights by five percent uh, relative to the previous year they won't really know for sure if that's five percent of their own height or five percent of the entire distribution of heights and if you give people risk ratios for like if you drink wine your chance of cancer goes up five five times people will find that very confusing and they'll they'll jump to the wrong conclusion from you know relative risk or absolute risk so often people think in absolute terms but the data are often in in relative terms so if you're using relative effect sizes, you need to make that really clear when you're communicating it to, to non-specialists. Uh, lots of data comes with um, yeah ratios or percentage changes, like all brain imaging, for example, that I've done, it's all percentage change. And then the best kind or the most statistical kind, you might say, is um, you don't retain any of the original data at all. So you don't, it's no longer a relative to a baseline. It's no longer got any meaningful units. And so it becomes a standardized effect size. And the way you do that is by removing information and and using the parameters of parametric statistics to create new numbers. So the kind of things you'll see in meta-analysis are going to be standardized mean differences, SMD or Cohen's D, correlation coefficients, partial eta squared. So these are all standardized effect sizes that tell you how many standard deviations are there between your two groups or conditions, how much do they co-vary, your two groups and conditions and then how much does your intervention explain in terms of the variance between your two groups or conditions and the conclusions you might make are something like this following the dietary intervention children's heights increased by 0.2 standard deviations and no one in the public would understand anything about what you're saying if you said that to them as you get more and more abstract you need to be better and better at statistics and you can't really interpret it without a good a good statistical training in some experiments, 0.2 standard deviations would be a would be a nice big effect. Like if you could really increase height by 0.2 standard deviations, you'd be you'd be very good. <laughs> uh, and in some experiments, it's really it's really a tiny effect. So even how big how big this is uh, just depends on the context as well. The simplest way of um, so we're going to sort of take more and more more and more involved ways of finding out how big something is relative to something else. And we're going to talk about these standardized effect sizes. So hopefully you know from your own field what counts as a big effect, whether it's marathon running or blood glucose or the hairiness of rats' paws. You should know what, what is a big difference and what's a small difference. But in the statistical world, all we really care about is, is the numbers themselves. And we don't really care about whether it's a meaningful big difference anymore. So that's your job as researchers to interpret the stats. But the stats are very easy to interpret, I think. So the simplest way, you've got an individual, say you found an individual patient or animal or human with a very high score on something, you can work out how, how far away they are from the mean. So you take an individual, this person X, XI, you subtract the population mean, divide by the population standard deviation, and you get a Z score. So if you get, let's say Usain Bolt, let's say he was the, far, he is the fastest runner ever um, over 100 meters. His, I can't remember his exact score, but let's say he was one standard deviation below the mean. So everyone else was running at about 9.9 .9 seconds and he was way down at 9.8 seconds. Let's say that was one standard deviation below. He would have a Z, ah, excellent. Thank you, Archie. <laughs> it's, wow, is it that, that small? Uh, right, so he's way down there. Let's say, he's a, let's say he's a whole standard deviation below the rest of the field, quicker than the rest of the field. His Z score would be one. So he's one standard deviation below. And I think he was pretty phenomenal. So he could well be, he could well be a standard deviation below on a, maybe his average score, his average time might well be a standard deviation below. If you look at comparable times, if you're looking at athletes, it may well be below by that much. But the key thing about this, which you almost never know, you need to know to, to do a Z score, you need to know the population standard deviation. And if you just say, well, my population is hundred meter finalists, in the Olympics in the last 10 years, say, or, or whatever, then that, that could be your population and then you can work it out. But normally you don't know this number. 
if you're doing a research study. But if you can create a, a reference distribution, a population to compare against, then a z-score might be fine for a single individual. Uh, and when you're doing an IQ test, so the, the IQ distribution by definition has a, a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. If you see these things, like squiggle n means it's normally distributed, squiggle n, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. So because these tests have been used for 100 years, IQ tests, um, there's enough data that they're confident in saying that when you do these tests, the average is 100 and the, and the standard deviation is 15. So you can give people a Z score for their IQ. So if you have a patient who has very low or very high IQ, you can give them a Z score and then, you know, treat them or study them on that basis. But that doesn't happen very often. So we're talking about individual subjects or individual cases. Uh, it doesn't happen very often in, in most statistics. So instead of a, a single mean, you, you, you're more likely to have a sample of data. So you, you get your sample of data and you can then, instead of a z-score, you can calculate a t-statistic. And that will allow you to compare your, your sample with any other number, any other single number. I remember the, remember the uh, standard error was one of the critical stats used in all kinds of, all kind of statistics. The t-statistic is very simply the mean divided by the standard error. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, and so the t-statistic is used in almost all stats, regression, t-test, obviously, and over. It's all, it's all the same. And it's all basically saying, take the mean or the mean difference and divide it by the standard error of the, the mean or the mean difference. When I first had to teach stats about 10 years ago, and I learned, when I learned this, everything then was suddenly, suddenly made sense. So uh, when you understand the t-test, I think everything else is easy. So a t-statistic tells you a bit like a z-score, how far away from some reference value am I? So if instead of a single Usain Bolt, you had, say, a sample of Usain Bolt's running times this year, you could then say, is, the, is Usain's average significantly higher or lower than, say, 10 or 9.9 .9 or 9.7, whatever it is? Is his average running time significantly lower than the previous world record, for example? And it probably would be because he's that good. So that's what you can do with a sample. You've got a sample of numbers and you can now compare that sample of numbers to a single reference. And that single reference could be zero, for example, or it could be something else. Uh, usually it's not zero. Usually we're not just comparing a sample with a, a single number, but we're looking at, say, differences. And this is where, yeah, most of all, all t-tests, this is now a t-test, essentially. If you've got two sets of data, so now you've got instead of just 10, 10 samples of Usain Bolt, you've got 10 samples of Usain Bolt and the next best, the next best runner. Uh, I'm sure I'll be told who that is shortly. Once you've got 10 of each of them, you can now compare. You get your t-statistic and compare the mean difference between the two. So up here, we've now got mean differences, not between each one and the mean, but between, say, running time of athlete A and running time of athlete B, or in a within subjects example, it might be on two different occasions, the Olympics and the world championships, say. So you've now got a difference between two conditions and you just sum up all those differences, divide by N and you've got the mean difference. And then if you do the same thing, but take the standard error of those differences, you can have the standard error of the difference. And here comes the science. The T test is the mean difference divided by the standard error of the difference. And that, when I learned that, when I really learned it, when I had to cal you know, I calculated it for myself in Excel and learned that, that was when statistics became easy for me. So it's really very, very simple. And it's the foundation of basically all parametric statistics. It's just the t-test, really, really simple. So you're taking the, the change in something and you're dividing it by the standard error of that change. So yeah, this, this is really it. As far as I can see, all statistics are how much something has changed or is different divided by the variability of that change or difference. So a z-score is the mean divided by the standard deviation, or rather the, you know, the mean difference divided by the standard deviation. The t is the mean difference divided by the standard error in a sample. The main effect size used for meta-analysis is mean difference divided by standard deviation of the difference. Standardized mean differences are exactly the same. Mean difference divided by pooled standard deviation differences. Regression uses this, co uh, correlation uses this, it's all the same. And all statistics that we're going to talk about, you measure something, you find the difference, and you look at the variability of that difference, often called the, the error. So how variable or how error prone is your data?
and that's it. T equals effect over SE. That gives you basically everything you need for all statistics. <laughs> Bit of a generalization, but um, I really think it's the key to understanding everything. So we've done T. Um, you don't get T statistics in, in meta-analyses very much because the T statistic depends on the sample size. To calculate T, you need to know the standard error. Standard error depends on the sample size, so T depends on the sample size. More useful is to use standard deviations because standard deviations don't depend on the sample size. And so Cohen's D, which is the most useful thing for meta-analyses, is the mean difference divided by the standard deviation of the difference. Uh, lots of people talk about Cohen's D and often don't define exactly what they mean. And if you're doing within subjects, there's a, there's a blog post here. Um, if you're doing within subjects designs, there are about five different ways you could calculate this. We're just using the, sim the simplest version about different scores. So the, the mean difference divided by the standard error, or st sorry, standard deviation of the mean difference. And that's sometimes called DZ, so we'll call it that. It's directly related, so Cohen's D is directly related to the t-test. So the t-statistic is Cohen's D multiplied by the square root of n. Note, this is extremely useful for meta-analysis. In a paper, a paper will often report a t-statistic, but not a Cohen's D. So if you need Cohen's D, you can just take the number of subjects and square root it and multiply it by Cohen's D. T and D are telling you basically the same thing, just one takes account of the number of subjects and one doesn't. If you don't have a t-score or you don't have um, the individual difference data, you can, if you just have means and standard deviations, you can calculate Cohen's d for, this is more for between subjects designs. So you just, let's say you have your mean of your patients and the, and the mean of your controls, and you have a, a standard deviation of both of them or pooled together, you can then do Cohen's D mean difference divided by the standard deviation. And so lots of between subjects meta-analyses, particularly clinical, clinical ones where you've got patients and controls and they're different people, um, they'll be using this version. And it's really important, Cohen's D for within and between are completely different. Uh, one, would, one would be much larger. Um, and so, yeah, you need to tell, tell us exactly what Cohen's D you're using. If you need to average means together, you can just multiply each one by the sample size, add them all up and divide them by the total number of samples. Uh, next one's a bit of a scary one. If you need to create a pooled standard deviation, so you've got two separate standard deviations, you're gonna to need to combine them. So you square each one, multiply it by the number of subjects minus one, add together the next one with the same thing, and then divide them all and then square root them back. So it's basically taking two individual standard deviations, squaring them, multiplying them by the number of subjects to get the variance, uh, adding them all together, and then going backwards to get back to standard deviation. Uh, there's a link on Wikipedia. You go to pooled standard deviation, I'll put a link in there. For every statistic in the world, you can get a standard error for it. So usually people don't report when they report Cohen's D, they just report Cohen's D, but you can get the standard error of Cohen's D if you need to know how variable is your Cohen's D, and it depends entirely on the number of subjects. So this uh, complex equation, it just contains D and N and nothing else. So if you've got two groups, you add together the numbers, uh, you just it's just a correction, essentially. It's a correction for Cohen's D, depending on the numbers, and it gives you an approximate standard error of Cohen's D. There's a formula there. You can read that uh, blog post if you like. Finally, we're nearly there. Again, in meta-analysis, you might start with a t-value in a paper, and you turn it into Cohen's D, and then some meta-analyses use Cohen's D, others use Hedges G. It's another correction of Cohen's D based on sample size. So you just get Cohen's D and multiply it by these numbers. And again, that just depends entirely on the number of subjects. So if, you're, if you've got a lot of data, Cohen's D and Hedges G is the same. And if you've got very small sample, Cohen's D is bigger than Hedges G. So when you see a meta-analysis with Hedges G, it's just Cohen's D with a, with a, a correction applied for sample size. And so you can always just convert between one and the other as long as you know the, the number of subjects. Another, another great thing about stats, parametric stats, is that everything can be converted to everything else. So T, the t-test and Cohen's D are directly related. And you can just reverse that equation, Cohen's D from a t-test value. 
correlation, Pearson's correlation coefficient is directly related to a student's t test. There's a t, and there's r over there. You can just calculate, convert them to. And this is my favorite. If you have an f test from an ANOVA, as long as you've only got two groups, so there's one degree of freedom, uh, you can just square, take the square root of the f value and you get the t score. That's great. And you can test that out in Excel if you want to prove that. In parametric statistics, they're all completely, they're all doing exactly the same thing, whether it's T, R, D, or F, they're all doing the same thing. And you can convert one into the other just by apply, applying an, an equation. So you, you occasionally hear people saying things like, oh yes, I don't do t-tests anymore. I only do ANOVA. Yes, it's my, I'm far better at statistics because I do ANOVA or whatever. It's the same, <laughs> it's the same test. Uh, or, you know, I, I do correlations, I don't do t-tests. It's the same, it's all the same. Uh, it's all the general linear model. When you're reading through papers, they will all report things in different ways. Uh, they will hide things, they will change the name of things, they will get some things wrong. And it is your job as a meta-analyst to extract what you need from the papers and get it into a common format. And that's uh, very difficult. These are some general rules of thumb. You, you want to end up with these, these three things for your study along with the sample size, so four things. You want n, the mean, sd, and Cohen's d, for example. So if the paper reports standard error, you can just convert that to standard deviation. If they report confidence intervals, you can convert that to standard error and then standard deviation. If they report a t-test, you can convert it straight away to Cohen's d. Some of the f-tests, you can convert those to t-tests and then to d. Uh, a correlation, you can convert to a t-test and then into d. So they're all completely inter interconvertible. And then if you want to be even bolder, um, you can just, if someone reports a median rather than a mean, you can just assume they're about the same, that's fine. If they only report the minimum and the maximum, you could just take the middle number and call that the mean. And you could also, if someone reports a non-parametric interquartile range, you can also convert that into a standard deviation. So for meta-analysis, all you're trying to do is convert everything that's reported into the same common format, basically to give you one number, Cohen's D.